So just quickly to talk through these uh, parts of the brain. So the instinctive part of the brain, it's the oldest part of the brain, but it's also far and away the most powerful. Okay, it's the part of the brain that was deal, de designed to deal with the caveman world, basically. And all of this time has evolved, and it's basically not evolved much in that period of time. So, and its primary purpose is to keep us alive, which it does in all sorts of ways. So firstly, by kind of keeping our hearts beating, you know, making sure that we keep breathing, all of this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, but also as well by continually scanning our environment and people around us and making rapid judgments about whether or not we're safe. And it does so in the blink of an eye. It does so in the tenth of a second, according to Princeton University. And it does so by kind of taking a quick image, stimulus, boom, checking it against like a huge photo bank reserve that we have in our minds, and then instantly sending up a judgment, good person or bad person. And so there, there's all of this extraordinary research in this space. Some of you will have probably you know, read stuff about how people, uh, jurors, make their minds up on whether or not uh, a witness is going to tell the truth before they've even opened their mouth. You've probably heard, read about that stuff before. There's heaps more. Once you start digging into this stuff about unconscious biases uh, that, you know, I was talking to... There we go. <laughs> um, about earlier. Um, there's heaps of stuff, and particularly important when it comes to leaders. So there's all these extraordinary stuff. We're more likely to trust people um, who are taller than people who are shorter. We're more likely to trust people who have brown eyes than who have blue eyes. We're more likely to trust people who have baby faces, people who have more symmetrical faces. There's all sorts of really weird stuff when you get into it. Um, and what it is, is that as we've evolved over the years, there's a reason where we trust people with baby faces. Why? Anyone? Innocent. Well, we're, we're, we have a survival need to look after babies, you know? That is how we protect our species. That's how we guarantee the future of our species. And so within our mind, our facial recognition zone, you see someone who has a baby face, you're drawn to them. You're instantly drawn to them. And so there's a survival instinct behind all of these things. One of the favorite bits of research that I stumbled in uh, across when um, I was researching the book uh, was about how men find women attractive. And there was a piece of research that was done where men were shown a series of pictures of women and they were asked to rate them. And like literally it was just two piles, kind of hot or not, you know, um, if you like. And what the, what the guys were doing was they were consistently putting women whose pupils were dilated into this pile and not into the others. Now, why would they do that? Dilated pupils are a sign of sexual arousal. When women are sexually aroused, their pupils dilate. But the guys, when you asked them, did you notice that their, women, that, 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 that their pupils were dilated, they said no. When they, they said to them, did you know that dilated pupils were a sign of sexual arousal, they said no. And so this was obviously something their instinctive brain was seeing that they were not, and it was basically telling them who was up for it and who wasn't, in a kind of discreet, shorthand kind of, kind of way. But this is the wonderful way in which our instinctive brain works, and it works entirely free from any rational scrutiny. So then moving up to the emotional brain. Now, the emotional brain is kind of a bit like a huge um, chemicals factory, which releases these powerful chemicals, chemicals like oxytocin, you know, cortisol, serotonin, all of these chemicals which flood our brain and reduce our capacity for rational, for rational thought. And when we say about, oh my God, it sent a shiver down my spine, or it made my you know, hair stand on end, what we're basically talking about is chemical reactions that are going on there. And great leaders will bring about these chemical reactions. They'll make us feel amazing. You know, like the old Mayor Angelou quote about, you'll forget what they've said, but you'll never forget how they made you feel. And the way that you're meant to feel these things is basically by the release of chemicals in your brain. And so that's something about what the um, emotional brain does. And, you know, people get addicted to the flow of these drugs as well. We do when we're 
you see people now addicted to their phones. We now pick up our phones. This is fine to take a photo. But we now pick up our phones, like to check our phones and do our little run-through 110 times a day on average. And we're chasing these little fixes. You know, oh, I've got another Facebook light. You know, a bit of more serotonin. You know, it's when it, there were all these different things that we're basically chasing. You get addicted to the highs of it. One of the things that I love, I'm you know, quite a fan of... Um, of uh, boxing, and Mike Tyson, I just read his autobiography, and he, for any of you who know about his background, he had the most terrible, like, feral background, basically. His mum kicked him out when I think he was seven, eight years old, or something like that, and he was brought up by gangs, was basically running wild. And then there was an elderly white guy who took him under his wing and led him you know, Customato was his name, and he was a trainer. And for that period, the period that Customato was alive, Tyson had some order in his life. And this is what Tyson had to say about Customato. Um, he said, I'd never heard anyone say nice things about me before. I wanted to stay around this uh, old boy because of the way he made me feel. Give a weak man strength, and you become addicted. And this kind of sums up the leadership transaction if you like, that this is what goes on, that the leader will meet the emotional needs of the people that they're leading, in return for which the people will provide their support. So Blair gave people hope for a long time, and in return he was granted with support. You know, George W. Bush gave the American people the feeling that he would keep them safe, and they gave him his support for as long as... He was doing that, and now, for some people, Jeremy Corbyn is providing an outlet for their anger, and he is winning their support, but it's an emotional relationship, constantly being renewed. So that's something about the emotional brain. Then the logical brain. The logical brain, we all like to imagine we're supremely rational creatures, of course, and, you know, always analysing the logic of everything. Anyone who's read any of these books recently by wonderful people like Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner, Thinking Fast and Slow or any of that, will know it's absolute nonsense. Most of the time, we go through the day and we're just making rapid judgments on things, really, really quickly, rule of thumbs, using things like heuristics. And the brain is not really as, as logical as we like to think it is. What happens instead is the brain kind of works like train maps. Things get connected together and then they become stuck together and we think there's a full logic that because something is said after something else we assume there's a connection for instance between the two things so that when we were writing speeches you know um, for Patricia Hewitt way, way back like one of the lines that appeared in government speeches all of the time back then was in 1997 we gave independence to the Bank of England since then the government has experienced the longest uninterrupted period of growth in its history it's a wonderful example of what the ancient Romans called post hoc ergo propter hoc after this, therefore because of this, you know? So it's an ancient Roman rhetorical device, but it's one now which neuroscientists would refer to, I forget who it was said it, but the neuroscientists said that when neurons fire together, they wire together, which is a nice little sound bite, isn't it?